Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Cheryl Welbeck. I'm the Project Manager at Directors of Health Promotion and Education. And welcome to today's webinar, which is Category A Presents, the American Planning Association. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, all lines are currently on mute to eliminate noise during today's presentation. To the right of your screen, you'll see a control panel. Um, a few things you might want to note in the control panel. Uh, at the very bottom of the control panel, there is an option for questions and another one for chat. If at any time during today's presentation you have technical issues or have any questions, I encourage you to use the question or the chat section. Uh, for chat, I would encourage you to use that for technical issues. If you have a question for the presenters, um, please go ahead and type it into the question box. Uh, but we would like to ask all of you to hold questions until the very end of the presentation, at which time we'll address those. Today's webinar will be recorded. A copy of the recording and slides will be available following the presentation. We'll distribute that within 24 hours of today's presentation. Uh, and welcome to all of you for joining today. Today's presenters from the American Planning Association, we have with us uh, Ms. Anna Ricklin and Mr. David Rouse. Uh, Anna Ricklin is manager of APA's Planning and Community Health Center. In this role, she works with APA members and partners to promote planning practice that supports public health. With a background in transportation, health impact assessment, and community design, Anna is an emerging leader in applied research, strategic planning, and coalition building. She has an MHS from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and she's been with APA since 2011. Welcome, Anna. We also have David Rouse. Uh, David has over 30 years of private, public, and nonprofit sector experience in community planning, design, and implementation. And as APA's research director, he oversees the Planning Advisory Service and the three national centers for planning. Uh, the three national centers are Green Communities, Hazards Planning, and Planning and Community Health. Prior to joining APA, David was a principal of WRT, a nationally recognized planning, urban, urban design, landscape architecture and architecture consulting firm. His projects, many of which received awards for excellence from APA or other organizations, included comprehensive plans for cities, counties, and regions, parks, open space, and green infrastructure plans, transportation, economic development, and urban design plans, and zoning and development standards and ordinances. Welcome to you both. So, and I'll go ahead and turn today's presentation over to you. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am going to go through a brief overview of APA as an organization um, and then talk a little bit about our project that we have um, in collaboration with the American Public Health Association that we're working with DHPE and other national partners on. So APA is a national independent nonprofit organization with about 40,000 members who for the most part are public sector planners uh, working at the local level in communities around the country to help plan and improve their communities. We have 47 chapters. Uh, most of them are based on our state. You can see a little snapshot of our website here with um, a picture of our chapters. And we have 21 special interest divisions which focus on topics as wide ranging as women and planning, hazards planning, economic development, and transportation. So we have a number of different ways that members can engage through the organization, um, as well as, of course, through the national organization. APA has been a leader in looking at how we can help and develop healthy communities for a number of years now. And a lot of that work has been done through the Planning and Community Health Center, where we focus on active living, food systems, and health in all planning policies, which is a, a kind of take on health in all policies where <clears throat> we're thinking about health in all um, elements of planning. So Cheryl mentioned a number of those in uh, the bio that she read for my colleague David Rouse, but thinking about how we can have health as part of comprehensive planning, how we can have health as part of zoning code, how we can have health as part of open space planning which David will talk a little bit more about. But um, the Planning Community Health Center is a great resource for additional materials at the intersection of planning public health. And here is the website to visit another time. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about the Plan for Health project, which is um, 
managed through the Planning Community Health Center, and as I mentioned, is collaboration between the American Public Health Association and APA as a key project partner. APHA is leading our evaluation efforts um, and, of course, providing public health expertise as we are working through our state chapters to actually implement the project. So the full vision of our project is to think about how we can integrate and institutionalize public health and planning where people live, work, and play. Um, and our two focus areas are nutrition and physical activity. And then we have an overarching focus area uh, to promote health equity, so thinking about how we can both impact everyone as well as uplift those who are most in need um, when it comes to nutrition and access to healthy foods and physical activity and access to op opportunities for moving. Uh, across all of our um, grantees, we are working to increase collaboration for not just planning and public health, but for a number of other partners. Um, increased community capacity to actually implement uh, planning and health-oriented goals, and increased collective messaging, which is um, thinking about how we can essentially shift the culture of planning and health to be more integrated, and how we can talk about that with everybody from your regular community member to uh, an elected official. Um, for our first cohort of grantees, we had a request for proposals that went out in uh, the last fall of 2014, and then we launched our projects in spring of 2015 for a 12-month implementation period. And before we talk about a few examples in more detail, I want to offer some a quick overview of uh, a snapshot, I guess, of our project. So uh, we have 18 grantees in 15 different states across the country. This is the first nine, and this is the second nine. Um, and I'd like to add that we have representation from across a variety of settings, including urban, suburban, and rural, as well as levels of intervention. So we have folks who are working at the um, whole county level, folks working at the city level, and then we even have a couple of grantees who are working just in their own small neighborhood. And here's a visual of how the grantees are spread out across the country. So I was talking a little bit about coalition building, uh, capacity building, and collective messaging. And here's a, a list of just some of the partners that our uh, coalitions are working with that make up our coalitions. So um, municipal planning departments and health departments and parks and recreation and transportation, but then also thinking about schools and universities, um, a number of different nonprofit organizations and advocacy organizations, as well as other kinds of health coalitions and foundations, um, and neighborhood associations and neighborhood groups who are participating. Across our coalition, some of our common strategies include, um, of course, involving public health uh, professionals and uh, planners with experience and training in both fields to lead the projects, reaching out to decision makers, and using data to shape the priorities of their project. This is a statement of our values for Plan for Health. Um, these are kind of the, the guiding uh, thoughts and um, values that we're using to talk about the project and uh, shape the vision of our project. Um, it's about building community, building relationships, and they're really, we're looking beyond our funding period and, and the one 12 month period that we have to work with our first cohort and the 12 month period we have to work with our second cohort. We're really thinking about the long view of, um, uh, for an outcome of the project, working towards social change, and how we build a movement. We've heard some great feedback from our coalition members. Um, we really like this quote from our colleagues in Idaho in our Boise project, who um, told us that they continue to learn so much from their public health partners. The Plan for Health project has sparked new conversations and new ways to connect around the issues that we all care so much about. Um, we loved hearing about that because it really shows how um, this project has helped launch n not just new partnerships, but new avenues and, and opened up new ideas for how 
uh, both health and planning can meet their mutual goals through working together. We've also engaged folks um, and the members of APA uh, in a number of different ways because they are really the experts in their own communities. And we value our member expertise and see throughout the Plan for Health project the knowledge and leadership that's happening at the local level. Uh, and it's really inspiring to see how much people achieve every day. It's helped us reach beyond the boundaries of our specific project and connect our community members with broad conversations at the intersection of planning and public health. Um, and a few weeks ago, we had a uh, webinar on health impact assessment, which, uh, in which we engaged folks from um, different coalitions to talk to our members broadly about HIA and planning. Um, and here's a quick snapshot of some of the HIAs, the health impact assessments that have been done on plans and policies across the United States. Um, and it's just a quick example from Plan for Health about how we at the national level hope to complement work at the local level. Um, and the work of three, these three local sites, Marion County, Indiana, Columbus, Ohio, and Metro Boston, really brought that work to life and made the discussion more than a pie chart. So regarding local capacity, um, we want to go into a couple of examples of that. Um, Plan for Health staff is striving to support coalitions through community building and technical assistance, um, also with the help from our colleagues at um, DHPE and the Society of Public Health Educators, we've been doing that as well. Um, and coalitions, in turn, are working to support their local communities by increasing capacity um, of their coalition and their communities. Um, and together, we have more than 80,000 members from APA and APHA um, who cannot directly participate in any one of the 18 coalitions. But we hope that a piece of that coalition story, strategy, and intervention will resonate and be transferable to communities beyond, um, the, beyond the ones that we're able to fund. And by building a continuum of Plan for Health experiences, urban, rural, and neighborhood, we hope that our members and anybody else who's interested will all be able to find something that could apply to yourself and your community. So our Austin Coalition and our um, Idaho Coalition, um, the Boise Group, are both working at the neighborhood level. And we can see how there's been such great uh, engagement in both of these communities um, for looking for engaging other organizations um, in their coalition. Austin has 86 different organizations who are working in their neighborhood, in that small neighborhood they're working in, um, on their outreach list. And that includes you know, the spectrum of different types of organizations. And in Boise, there's 12 strong neighborhood groups um, in that VISTA neighborhood who are working together. And they're really emphasizing the partner coalitions and, and joint subcommittee work that are really doing the on-the-ground efforts to um, implement the goals of their project. And when we're thinking about um, implementation, the concept of policy systems and environment strategies, PSEs, are really central to um, planning as a field, naturally as a field. And David's going to go more into that and, and sort of exemplify how planning itself is a policy intervention. It's a systems intervention. It's an environmental intervention. And so matching planning with uh, public health efforts is really a natural fit. And an example is from our Nashua Coalition in New Hampshire um, working on a complete streets project. Um, for them, the, they're looking at, of course, physical activity. Um, and building messaging around that, which is a, this is a snapshot of some of their messaging. Um, and so they're explaining what Complete Streets is and how it fits into the public health message um, to get people more active. And it's a, a wonderful example, local example of um, building capacity and planning for public health efforts. And then one more example um, is, this is a, a map that was provided to us from Summit County in Ohio and um, mapping food deserts 
in that county. And the lighter areas are the areas where there are, are food deserts, less access to healthy food. Um, and mapping is another example of how planning can participate in uh, public health efforts by really um, making a pictorial description of um, access and health in this kind of way. And with that, I will pass it on to David for talking about how um, the big picture of planning. Uh, thanks, Anna, um, for the overview of Plan for Health. And uh, I was asked for this, uh, for this webinar to talk about planning in general. What is planning? Sort of frame it in terms of hopefully folks in public health who may not necessarily be that familiar with, with planning can understand. And really, I also want to tie this to you know how planning and public health come together. So thinking about this assignment, I started with the question, well, what is planning? And how do you explain planning? It's a very complex topic. So I started by going to our website. And this is from the APA uh, web, uh, website. And you see a definition here on the screen. It's a, a direct quote. Planning is a dynamic profession that works to improve the welfare of people in their communities, et cetera. And what this really boils down to is creating better places for present and future generations. Planners have a long-term perspective on this. Another way of looking at this is thinking about interventions in the built environment through uh, some of the things Anna talked about, policy systems and environmental uh, uh, change and in investment to make great communities happen, which happens to be sort of APA's tagline of what planners and what we're trying to accomplish. And finally, in simple terms, you see a graphic here. It's actually from the final presentation for the Albany 2030 Comprehensive Plan, that's Albany, New York, the state capital a few years ago, in which they listed the top 10 reasons people should care about their comprehensive plan. And right up at the top is it will help make Albany or any city or community where you and your children want to live. So moving on, the next thing I thought about, well, what is it that planners do? And I'm a planner, and I love to make plans, and planners love to make plans. We're known for doing that, but going through the process of making plans, and then uh, documenting that process in the final document. So there are various types of plans that you're probably familiar with. Uh, the, uh, the, the great uh, community-wide plan is a comprehensive plan. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, it's also referred to as a general plan in California, some other places. Basically, this is a plan for a jurisdiction, a municipality, to, to guide growth and change across a range of community systems from land use to transportation, economic development, etc. Then there's also what are called in the planning jargon functional plans. I like to call them system plans because they focus on particular community systems. Here's a few examples here. Transportation. Is a, is a good example. Also, uh, planners are starting to do food system plans. And the reason I highlighted those is there are two areas that are being looked at in Plan for Health by some of our uh, uh, coalitions, and I'll come back to those. And finally, beyond the city scale, plan, planners work at different scales. So we also work at sub-area and neighborhood scale, sub-area and neighborhood plans, and at the regional uh, scale as well. And that image that you see is from the Aust Imagine Austin, uh, Texas Comprehensive Plan. I'm going to come back to this, uh, but it, 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 uh, it uh, illustrates a real importance of community engagement and planners getting more and more interested in, in, in engaging all segments of the community in developing these plans. But it's not enough just to make a plan the, uh, the, the, uh, and have it sit on the shelf, as the, as the cliche goes. Plans are only effective if they're implemented, and that's what I would characterize as the second major area in which planners work. Uh, so, for example, here's another one of the uh, graphics from the Albany 2030 Comprehensive Plan. Their comprehensive plan identifies specifically projects that their city will, will, will put into place to implement the comprehensive plan, looking at time frames from the immediate short term, one year, to five and ten years and beyond. And there are various ways in which planners uh, implement plans. Uh, one of the most important, of course, is zoning and development regulations that influence the built environment. Uh, planners work on developing those to implement uh, goals ideally laid out in the comprehensive plan. 
Also what's called current development, looking at development reviews, making approvals, uh, hopefully developing uh, the community consistent with that vision that's laid out in the plan, and uh, also developing capital improvement programs and projects. And I'd like to highlight this last uh, bullet here. We're talking about policies, programs, and particularly partnerships because we see that as being an emerging area in comprehensive planning practice. Uh, traditionally, planners have worked maybe with their public health, uh, excuse me, uh, public works departments, transportation departments, uh, perhaps parks and recreation and implementing plans. But we see the range of partnerships expanding both within city and outside city governments to develop and implement plans. So from a health perspective, the public health department has a real important role to play. And also beyond the city government, healthcare institutions, nonprofits with a special interest in health can work to implement comprehensive plans. Uh, so again, uh, keeping on, the, on this theme of the comprehensive plan, let's take a little bit of a closer look. Very important uh, foundation underpinning of the comprehensive plan is it is a legal mandate for decision making by local governments. So thousands of them across the country have these comprehensive plans. And that really sets the uh, agenda for decision makers in terms of looking at the future of their community. They do, uh, the comprehensive plan has that long range perspective. Uh, we like to say it's a reflection of community values and aspirations, the best plans are and to express those, they engage the public in developing the plan. So it ought to lay out sort of a shared vision of what that, uh, that particular jurisdiction, that community wants for their future. Also like to say it's a guide for managing change, and we all know how change is uh, accelerating in this century particularly. So rather than reacting to change, which is a normal human response, the comprehensive plan at its best is a tool to help a community get out in front of, to anticipate and prepare for change by identifying those policies, regulations, investments, et cetera, for implementation. Uh, so at the bottom of this slide, uh, there is a little diagram, and this important diagram, so I'd like to just go through it quickly. It's about what we call the three phases or three major steps that you take in take carrying out a comprehensive plan. The first is to ask, where are we now? What are the existing conditions? Uh, that are impacting and affecting the community and how do those conditions uh, project into the future? For example, what are the growth and development uh, projections as you look forward? I think health data has a very important role to play in this and it's one of our themes uh, uh, that we're talking about today. The second is given that those existing, existing conditions and trends, how satisfied are you with them? Do you want to maintain them or do you want something better or different for the future? So phase two, ask the community collectively, what do we want our city, our county, our community to be? In the, typically in the form of a future vision and goals, looking 20 or 30, 20 years or more into the future. And as part of this, planners like to go through what we call a scenario uh, process, looking at alternative scenarios of growth and change to achieve that vision. And through that process, defining the preferred future scenario, which sort of defines where the community wants to go, looking again 20 or more years into the future. And then phase three is the implementation element. How do we actually get there? How do we achieve that vision and that future scenario? It lays out strategies, tra strategies and actions, an action or implementation schedule, timeframes, responsibilities, sources of resources, and then a way to monitor progress, plan monitoring, typically with indicators that you can be used to, to, to monitor over time the extent to which you're, you're, achieving, you're achieving the goals and objectives of that comprehensive plan. So I mentioned the Imagine Austin comprehensive plan. I'll just quickly go through those three phases. Uh, I was actually, in my prior career, uh, a consultant for this plan several years ago. Uh, Austin, Texas, for those who, who may or may not know it, is a, a major Texas city plan and the planning area for the for this comprehensive plan was 600 square miles or so with just under a million people projected to experience tremendous growth over the planning horizon of 30 years adding 750,000 new residents 300,000 new jobs so the planning challenge was how do we accommodate that change in a way that we can sort of maintain and make Austin better for the future how can we deal with impacts on 
transportation and infrastructure, natural resources, et cetera. So in phase two, that phase where the community asks itself, what do we want to be, uh, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, there was a collective process to develop a future vision for Austin. The major elements are listed here. Austin will be livable, natural and sustainable, mobile and interconnected. That had to do with sort of transportation uh, connections, et cetera. And then a scenario development process, looking at different ways uh, Austin could grow and achieve, uh, grow and change over the future, ending up with a scenario called compact and connected as being the preferred future growth pattern structured around centers and corridors as a way of accommodating all those new, new residents and jobs that, that are coming in the future. And think about the connection of compact and connected walkable communities to public health, because that's an important part of this. Finally, in phase three, how do we get there? The community again went through an extensive uh, participation process and identified what were called eight priority programs. These were the things that, were, that Austin is focusing on moving forward, and they're implementing these, uh, these programs now. I just wanted to highlight a couple of them. First is the idea of invest in a compact, connected Austin, that idea of the scenario you saw. And the capital investment improvement programs are looking at public transit and other investment sidewalks to promote this idea. But then number seven, one of the priorities is create a healthy Austin program. How do we make Austin a healthier community in the future? And that obviously, again, relates to the idea of compact and connected, but there are a lot of other things that, that were, I, were outlined in that program, such as access to healthy foods. And going back to the idea of partnerships, the public health department has actually took a lead role or taking a lead role in implementing this program working with the planning department and others. So um, I'm switch gears a little bit here. I'm actually was a history major as an undergraduate, so I love history. And I'd love to go back and think about the historic roots of what we do, and particularly planning and public health. And uh, really, we started as the same profession going back to the 19th century. Also, landscape architecture was part of the mix, too. I'm actually trained as a landscape architect. Um, but what you see here are a couple of the historic figures from uh, back in the uh, 19th century. Frederick Law Olmsted uh, is known as the father of landscape architecture. Uh, he basically is the one who's known for, for starting the landscape architecture uh, uh, profession in this country through design such as Central Park in New York City. But a little known fact is that he was the executive secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission during the Civil War. And in that role, he was dedicated to improving sanitation and health of the Union uh, military camps and the soldiers who were in them, and which in, in that role, he's really been called the first Surgeon General of the United States, so it wasn't called that. And also, the Sanitary Commission was the model and evolved in, apparently into the Red Cross. So a landscape architect, a physical designer, was one of the, really, the one, perhaps the first official public health uh, figure in, in our country. The second uh, uh, person I'm showing here, uh, someone I admire greatly, is, J is Jane Addams. Uh, again, going back to the 19th and early 20th century, she was a social reformer and an urban planner. Uh, she embodies the social advocacy roots of the playing profession through her work with the Hull Settlement House in Chicago. And she was a tireless advocate for the needs of women, children, immigrants, the poor, was an early, uh, one of the, the country's early public health uh, workers. So my point here is that landscape architecture, city planning, and by the way, Frederick Law Olmsted's uh, son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., was what the first city planner. He started, to, uh, for example, served on the Macmillan uh, Commission, which developed an early uh, 20th century plan for Washington, D.C., and public health share common roots together going back to, back to the in, in, uh, 19th century and early 20th century. And what happened in the 20th century is that they diverged and we're all going and we get specialized, we're working in our silos. But in the 21st century, we see everyone coming back together again, kind of working together around common concerns and issues. And I think that's really important and embodies what Plan for Health is about. One last slide on this connection between planning and public health. This happens to be from 
Another uh, CDC-supported project that we've been working on for a number of years on looking at public health in the planning process and comprehensive planning in particular. And as part of this project, what you see is a diagram that we developed thinking about a model for integrating public health again into the comprehensive planning process. So if you look closely at this, you can see phase one, phase two, phase three, which I talked about, all within an overall mission and purpose of improving community health by in integrating health into comprehensive planning and implementation. So not just during the process of developing the plan, as I talked about, but as a continuous process from organizing for change up front, getting coalitions and partners together like public health and uh, and, uh, professionals and planners, and then again in implementing the plan by forming implementation partnerships, et cetera. So it's thinking of comprehensive planning as an ongoing continuous process, a logic model, if you will, for promoting health in the built environment through planning. Okay, I'm going to spend the last few minutes uh, talking about, again, some of our coalitions and the work they're doing and relating it to some of the themes that I just reviewed. Uh, Anna hit on a few of these, uh, and you, I think you meant, might have mentioned Austin, Texas already, and I've talked about Austin. They are one of our uh, coalitions uh, that's working at the neighborhood scale, a large neighborhood scale, in the Runberg uh, neighborhood, which is a largely Hispanic uh, community, I believe, in north central uh, Austin. And their strategies are looking, they're focusing on both nutrition and physical activity. And, and they're looking to increase understanding of chronic disease in the community and how to address it to increase positive attitudes towards the use of active transportation. Uh, they have this, uh, uh, they have this um, a tool they call Smart Trips. And then using that to improve access to healthy food through a food system toolkit. And I just wanted to touch Again, back on the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan, because as, as you recall, I talked about the Create an Healthy Austin program. This project, uh, this project uh, that our local coalition is doing is a direct implementation of that plan. So it ties back to one of the priority programs. It shows you the purpose of a comprehensive plan, because it can direct and resources and focus on those key implementation uh, tracks that are laid out in the comprehensive plan. This is an implementation of their comprehensive plan. Uh, keeping on the uh, theme of comprehensive planning, uh, another one of our coalitions is Trenton, New Jersey, the Healthy Communities uh, Initiative. Uh, this is a, uh, the Austin Project in neighborhood scale. This is a citywide scale for the capital city of New Jersey. Their defined reach is around 57,000, which I guess is about half of their population. but what they're doing is looking at their master plan. That's what in New Jersey they call their comprehensive plan, a community master plan. And they're creating, as they're updating their master plan, a new health and food systems master plan element. So you can see the goals laid out on this, uh, on, on this slide. But what they're looking to do is to encourage health-oriented partnerships, increase health literacy, literacy among Trenton residents, increase understanding regarding the health impacts of policy and planning decisions, promote a health focus in local government decision making by city departments, boards, and commissions. So they have ambitious goals for this project. And beyond that, and this is one thing we at APA are interested in doing through this initiative, is replicating this and, uh, as a model and promoting as a model for other communities in, in New Jersey to include public health considerations and master plans and other local uh, governmental decision, uh, decision making. And as the capital city of New Jersey, they're well positioned to do that. Uh, moving back down to the neighborhood scale, and this is a neat uh, project in St. Louis, Miz uh, Missouri, their uh, HEAL partnership, Healthy Eating, Active Living. And they're at the neighborhood scale, but they're looking at four neighborhoods and particularly with a goal of reducing obesity in the city by 5% by 2018, they've come up with this idea of creating pop-up temporary traffic calming demonstrations, sort of like parking day in a sense, if you know about parking day, which come, is coming up across the country in a couple of weeks. But it's like they call it a lending library of materials that can be taken to a neighborhood laid out. Here's what it would look like to make our 
our neighborhood more pedestrian friendly. And so they're starting in these four neighborhoods, but they want to replicate this uh, in neighborhoods throughout the city to, to, to help reach that goal. So we, that's a pretty cool uh, creative uh, project by one of our uh, grantees in St. Louis. Moving up in scales, and I talked briefly, I just mentioned the regional scale, and planners like to work regionally, and that's sort of a scale at which you can have the uh, most impact. And one of our uh, grantees is a region. It's the Eastern Highlands, Connecticut region. That's 10 rural towns in northeastern Connecticut, I believe, with a reach of around 40,000. So, you know, these uh, small towns, uh, rural places, often have limited capacity. So the idea that the coalition has, and this established coalition uh, looking at health, health issues, is to develop a toolkit aimed at uh, particularly at, at planning decision makers, planning and zoning commissions in these communities, to equip them with an understanding of how planning can impact long-term public health and how they can use zoning and development and other planning tools to promote and improve uh, uh, public health. So their strategy is to increase the number of the uh, in influencing these officials and also increasing the number of local residents who engage in planning and other processes to promote health in, in plant local planning and, and zoning conditions. Another example uh, at the scale of a city, I'm kind of jumping around in terms of scale, but this is Bensonville, Illinois. It's a city of about 18,000 folks. Uh, their focus area is on physical activity, so they're, they're developing an active transportation plan. goes back to what I talked about earlier, a functional or system plan, but looking at transportation for health, for promoting physical activity. And as part of implementation of that, a complete streets uh, policy. They're particularly focused on connecting low-income and, and Hispanic residents to transportation and recreation activities. Another city in the Midwest, much larger than Bensonville, is Indianapolis, Indiana. This is a, their Health by Design project. Uh, so that's a city of about 900,000. So their reach is around 460,000. That's 50 percent of that they've they've uh, they've identified. And this coalition is working on making Indianapolis safer and more accessible for pedestrians. At the top is just a heading from. Uh, uh, a questionnaire that they that they're circulating uh, to their residents around how walkable is your neighborhood. Uh, so again, thinking of the idea of a functional or system plan, they're developing a pedestrian master plan and pedestrian program to promote community walkability and walking. And they're also providing education and training uh, for planning and public health professionals and students to work together on on walking issues and uh, along with a community wide communications campaign around this. Uh, another scale, uh, comprehensive plans can be done by cities, they can be done by towns, they're also done by counties. So one of our grantees is Kenton County, Kentucky. Their focus area is on nutrition. Uh, they particularly are focusing on healthy corner sto stores and establishing a food uh, policy council. All to achieve the goal of providing better access to nutritious food across the county. And one of the neat things they've done, and this might have been touched on in one of the other webinars that may have uh, looked at uh, corner stores, but as part of their corner store initiative, they developed a pretty neat uh, model in terms of a two-phase application process uh, to identify corner stores, owners interested in participating in this program. So this is just a uh, uh, you know, snapshot of some of the application materials, but you can see their question questionnaires in phase one is kind of an initial general screening and then a more in-depth um, questionnaire for phase two to really start working with owners who are particularly interested in moving this forward. So this is a model that others that are working on these issues uh, might be interested in looking at. I'm going to conclude uh, by talking about Chatham County, Georgia. That's uh, Savannah, Georgia, and the surrounding county. Uh, their focus area is in nutrition, and they have a very established coalition, actually, that uh, Healthy Savannah that's been working on these uh, issues for a while. But so they're using this grant to really leverage and move some of the existing efforts forward. Uh, particularly by they're their con conducting a needs assessment around their food system. 
looking at how to connect local farmers to new customers, particularly in institutions, focusing on promoting food access in at-risk communities, and then working to get officials, again, to incorporate health into decision making. And I particularly wanted to talk about Chatham County because Anna and I and Elizabeth Hartig, who's our uh, uh, project coordinator on this project, had an opportunity to do a site visit uh, in, at the end of July to Chatham County, Savannah. So if you look in this photo, the person in the front is actually Lorraine Reed. She's our program officer. This is me back here, in case you're wondering what I look like. Mm -hmm. I don't see Anna, but uh, over here, actually, with sort of its back turn, that's uh, that Shedrick Coleman happened to be, happens to be a local architect and a member of the American Planning Association's Board of Directors, to our surprise, showed up at the site visit. And where the site visit was held is at what's called now called Sustainable Fellwood, which was renamed by the residents as part of looking a redevelopment of a housing authority property formerly called Selwood, uh, excuse me, Selwood Homes. And they looked at real, uh, the developers, quote from the developer, was, uh, was developed with a vision to redefine affordable housing resulting in an energy efficient and healthier property. So what you see us doing in the site is this, we're out in their organic garden, which is uh, tended to by residents of, of what is now called sustainable fellwood, but uh, and we heard it was a uh, was a roundtable that they they held, and we heard some interesting comments from residents and challenges and struggles they face. This is one of the poorest parts of Savannah, you know, finding access to affordable, healthy food, and it's not just lack of grocery stores. One of the things they talked about was the major artery that's right out in front of the uh, out in front of sustainable fellwood that they have, you know, it's difficult to cross safely to get to where the grocery store site will be. So there are real issues out there and you know that's really what we're we and we I, we know you are and all the coalitions that are working under this grant are struggling with is a commitment to achieve change at the local level to promote health. So I wanted to close and I with a quote uh, from uh, one of my favorite, uh, again, a historic person, a renowned anthropologist who was called uh, Margaret Mead. And what she says, one of my favorite quotes, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I think that quote kind of summarizes the spirit and what we're trying to accomplish uh, through Plan for Health. So with that, I'm going to close and sort of open it up for questions and discussion. Okay. Anna and David, both, thank you both for um, your presentation today um, and for providing a, an overview of both planning and the plan for health community. Uh, as David said, the, the floor is now open for anyone who has any questions. Uh, there is a question box in the control panel uh, to your right. If you have a question, you can type your question into the question box, or if you prefer, you can uh, click the icon to raise your hand, and we'll be happy to address uh, whatever question you have. Okay, floor is open for any questions. Yeah, we're seeing some questions pop up on the screen. Here's a question. Okay. Uh, if I've never worked with planners, how would I invite a planner to join my coalition? Anna, you want to answer that? Wow, okay. Um, well, I, I think one of the best ways would be to um, explore a little bit what planning is in your community. So there's um, there's almost always some kind of planning activity happening where planners are looking for input um, and having public meetings. And attending a public meeting and learning more about planning um, in your own community is a great way to um, meet planners and understand a little bit about what they do specifically in your community. Um, you can also feel free to reach out a number of uh, Cities and towns and uh, counties have what they call community planners whose role is to actually um, 
be a liaison between the planning department and planning activities and the um, community members. So finding out who those folks are, um, probably just through the website, is another great way to connect to the planning department. Um, and then the often the planning commission is a, a body made up of um, elected officials, regular citizens, um, professional planners, a, a collection of folks who you can connect with and so um, maybe reaching out to your city council person or selectman or um, your elected official at the local level and asking them to introduce you to the planning commission or introduce you to um, any planners who work for your city or town would be another good way to um, talk to planners if you've never reached out to them before, especially if you're inside city government or work for another organization who works with city government. Yeah, just quickly, Ed, I'm seeing a, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in uh, planners on both sides of planners and public health uh, uh, professionals working together. So, you know, hopefully that's what we're trying to promote, and we'll see more and more of that moving forward. And again, I would encourage all public health professionals to get find out about a local uh, your local community's comprehensive plan and look at for ways to get engaged in it. Uh, I've got a couple more questions that popped up here, several more. Okay. Here's a question uh, along the same lines. What is the biggest challenge APA faces in bridging the gap between planners and public health practitioners? And I think I'll start that. And it goes back to what I talked about earlier. And we all know about silos. We tend to work in our own professional spaces and have our own views and perspectives and, and things as basic as terminology we use a lot of jargon and I probably use jargon in this presentation for example that public health folks aren't familiar with and, and vice versa so it's finding the common ground in language and terminology I really do feel like planners and public health folks work in the same space we just come from it from different perspectives with different skills and expertise. One of the things, for example, I'm really impressed with in my public health colleagues is the discipline around evidence and making sure things are based on evidence. And I think you have a lot to bring the planners in terms of giving us that kind of evidence and rigor and discipline. So again, you know, the question was about barriers and challenges. The challenge is, is, is being in silos and not necessarily connecting. But I think that there are opportunities to do so as well as, as we've talked about. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Anna. Well, I think um, you know ultimately, as with almost anything, one of the challenge, greatest challenges is um, having time and and having helping people understand that um, this is a priority uh, for them as well as their other duties and have, helping people to see that. Um, infusing public health into their planning work or reaching out to planners as part of your public health work um, is actually still, is, is not an extra, but it actually can be infused into um, your current work and your current priorities because I think um, we talked about the, the mutual benefit of, of integrating public health and planning for both fields. And so um, I think, you know, the challenge is time and, and feeling like you don't want anything extra, but the solution is really just kind of shifting your perspective and um, seeing how you can help one another. Uh, here's another question. It looks like it might, it's a little bit of a follow-up to an earlier one, but uh, would you recommend reaching out to APA chapters? And uh, Anna, you, taught, you touched on the chapters a little bit uh, earlier, and uh, maybe you can uh, respond to that. Yeah, I think, I think um, our chapters are a really great avenue for uh, meeting your planners who are in your local community. So, you know, we have chap we have 47 chapters in um, that include all 50 states in the U.S. and um, they and Puerto Rico, and they also they are made up of people who are working at the local level in that state for the most part. So, um, I think chapters are a good avenue for finding out what's going on in your state. Um, it varies greatly by state. Uh, the engagement of you know different cities and towns in, in the various parts of the state. But um, I think if you're a public health person, you know the our project is really based on connecting the APA chapters um, and who are working you know our members of our chapters who are working at the local level and then members of the um, American Public Health Association state affiliate group and their folks who are working at the local level and, and connecting them. So I think, sure, reaching out to chapters is a great way, and, and our chapters um, 
page that I had a snapshot of at the beginning of the webinar, there actually is contact information for our chapters. Yeah, just to add a couple of things, um, you know, we're seeing some good partnerships happen between APHA and APA affiliates that hadn't known each other before this. For, for example, the, the, the uh, chapter and affiliate uh, presidents in Texas are getting to be great friends and talking about working on stuff together and speaking at their, their, their respective state conferences. I also wanted to mention APA also has local sections. So I used to be in uh, Philadelphia and I was very active. There is a Southeast Pennsylvania section based in Philadelphia. So if you're in a major city, I know Chicago is another one that has them, you might look and get involved locally and see if there are ways you could do joint programs uh, between, you know, yeah, obviously between uh, that, that revolve around this issue of uh, public health. So I, I have another question. It's probably coming from Sophie. Uh, it says, how can local Sophie chapters connect with APA chapters? You want to take that one, Anna? Um, well, we can introduce them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, um, good, good question. We, we yeah. can introduce uh. them. You know, the, our chapters, um, as most chapters do have um, a leadership structure with uh, people who cycle in and out as presidents and um, and other roles in the leadership of the chapter. So uh, probably the best way would be to introduce the presidents of the various chapters uh, of different organizations and um, make sure that they know one another and have direct communication because the presidents are the ones who are really charged with ensuring that messages get out across the chapter membership. And since Sophie is focused on public health education, I think there's a natural connection here because the APA chapters, they're really focused on education and programming. So they all have annual conferences in the fall. So I think it'd be an opportunity to reach out around maybe some educational programming. And then local uh, uh, sections as well, as I mentioned, Philadelphia or Southeast uh, Pennsylvania section, we would put on little events, educational events. So I'm sure there's some potential connections there. Great, thank you both. I, I have um, I have a question, um, just based on um, today's presentation. I know David, you talked a little bit about uh, the three types of planning, like the comprehensive plans and uh, functional or system plan and uh, sub area plans. And then mm -hmm. you kind of gave examples of um, some that some of the plan for health communities that are focused on sub-area plans and a couple with the comprehensive plans. How often are uh, comprehensive plans revisited by planners? And how likely is it that um, coalitions, either APA coalitions or other coalitions, might be able to influence what's in a, a comprehensive or, or long-term plan? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, we like to recommend that comprehensive plans uh, be updated and revisited on a five to 10 year time frame. Okay. Communities don't always do that. Some of them, Austin actually went for over, partly for political reasons, but they went for over 30 years between their comprehensive plans. They tried to do one in between and politically fell apart. It can be controversial. But some have never done them and are just doing them for the first time. Actually, Albany, Albany, New York, I put the examples up, had never one done one in its history and it was over 400 years old. So I like to you know, I was a consultant for that effort as well. I'd like to say you're making history here. You haven't had a comprehensive plan in 400 years. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends. I, to, again, it's, reach, I, it, it's a matter of reaching out to your planning department and finding out what the status of a comprehensive plan is. Uh, they're, you know, all, you know, on a collective basis across, say, a region, state, the, the nation, there are literally dozens and hundreds of these things that are being done. So it all, it all depends on where in the planning cycle you are. And, you know, perhaps if the, plan, the community hasn't done a comprehensive plan for a while, you might suggest here's an opportunity to do one and maybe think about some public health, community health issues in doing it because we have real issues in our, in our community. It's a way of advancing a community health agenda through the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Okay, last call for folks on the line. If you have questions for David Rouse or uh, Anna Ricklin at American Planning Association, now would be the time to either raise your hand or put your question in the box. 
Uh, we are drawing near the top of the hour. And I don't see any other questions out there. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, today's webinar is recorded. Uh, if you or someone you know of would like access to these materials, we will share those uh, in the next 24 hours or so. Um, David and Anna, thank you for today's presentation, for sharing your expertise and, and more information about the Plan for Health community. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all for listening in. Yeah. Great. With that, we'll conclude today's webinar. Thank you, everyone.